Hello and welcome to the Leadership Journeys podcast by TIAA Global Capabilities. For the very first episode, we have the EVP and CEO of TIAA Global Capabilities, Ms. Ondra Majumdar. Ondra, welcome to the show. Very happy to be here. So, Ondra, the first episode that we're talking about is obviously on leadership and ownership. But before we speak about all those things, right, I actually want to go back uh, to your childhood, to your influences in childhood. Uh, I think you were born in Calcutta. If I'm not wrong, you spent your growing up years there and your formative years there. So what were some of the values that really shaped you while you were growing up? Were you always a leader when you were in school, when you were in college? Uh, how did that thing? I, I would love to hear your, th- hear your thoughts. You know, that, that question sort of takes me back to my childhood. And uh, when, I, when I think back of some of my experiences and how they shaped me, the first thought that comes to my mind is uh, that I most I spent most of my childhood with my grandparents right. because my parents were moving around the country. And from them, I learned about uh, nurturing, caring, empathy. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, intrinsic to who I am as a, as a person. Um, if, I, if I think about uh, my mother, mm. she was uh, far less demonstrative, right. uh, quite strict. Uh, but she always encouraged me to learn and have an opinion about things. Lovely. And she taught me that it was okay uh, to have an opinion and to speak up and be transparent. And this I'm talking about Sri 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay, wow. That's um, a while back. I was I, certainly not born back then. Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, this was way before your time. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, it didn't matter that I was just really a small child. Uh, She used to ask me about my opinions about the things that I'd read, I'd seen. And that gave me a lot of confidence uh, that, as I said, that it was okay to have an opinion. And in those days, there were some set concepts about what a girl child would grow up to do, to be. Um, But she had no bias whatsoever. That was the other thing that I think I imbibed as as a young person that bias has no place. Uh, I love that. That's that's a great line right there. But and uh, and that's that's obviously, you know, been an intrinsic part of who I became later as a leader. If I now move to my father, he's an engineer. He's uh, very much an engineer even today in his <laughs> very late years uh, yeah. in his heart. And from him, I learned about planning mm-hmm. and um, maniacal focus on execution. Right. He was great at his work. And those values have been quite invaluable for me right. in my leadership journey. And I think the, the last one that I'd like to mention are my two aunts. Okay, uh, both, interesting. Both my role models. Right. Because they started their careers quite late. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they got married, they were raising children, and they both of them decided to go back to learning. Lovely. And to uh, start their careers uh, late in their um, late in their lives, they were successful. And um, from them, that I learned that as long as you are able to balance and prioritize, mm-hmm. you can actually aspire for everything. Right. Um, and there's really no limit. Absolutely. So those are my very early childhood influences and. The that, values that I grew up with. No, that's really amazing, Anil, because usually, you know, whenever we discuss influences, we usually restrict it, okay, you know, our parent, probably uh, like your mother or father. But I love how you're getting all of those perspectives and that you're really taking the best out of all of these people. So be it execution, be it perfection, uh, resilience. Uh, but talking about re- resilience, you know, it's one thing which always comes to mind when somebody's growing up, uh, when they have their initial jobs, right? When you're starting out, like, you know, when you're a fresher, there are many challenges that you face. Uh, because let's admit it, it's it's a difficult world out there, right? And especially if you know you've done college and then you go out to the big bag world, as it were. So tell me about some of your trials that you faced in your initial jobs and how do you overcome them? Because to have that vision while you're just a fresher, while you're just starting out, how do you sort of overcome that? That is an interesting question because um, I think, and I wouldn't necessarily call them trials; they were challenges. Right. right. And one came pretty early in my career. Okay. Um, Literally with my first job. Okay. Um, so I actually started my career as a software developer nice. in a startup. Now, mind you, those terms did not exist. Exist. Uh, sense, yeah, right? I'm sure. Yeah. You were basically a programmer in a small firm. Right. Um, who was setting uh, setting up. 
but I realized that I was bad at it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't enjoy it at right. all. Now, I solved that problem. I changed tax. I um, went into um, banking, which uh, I was always interested in, but which I then grew to love. Right. And I became good at it. So in that sense, I solved the problem. Mm -hmm. But it's not about the solution right. that stayed with me. What I learned from that was that you need to fail fast. Okay. And you need to have an alternative plan. Right. Um, and um, I think that has been one of the things that I've always been very conscious of, that it's okay to make a mistake. Right. But you always have to be conscious that there can be mistakes and you need to mm. have a plan. Right. Um, later on, there was another uh, incident or situation mm -hmm. which also gave me a lifelong lesson. Okay. And this is an important one, especially for those uh, who come into financial services, because more often than not, mm -hmm. you are involved in functions and processes which have some sort of financial implication. Absolutely. And very early on in my career, when I had just started managing a team, I entrusted a team member with some work. Uh, and an error occurred due to negligence and there mm. was some financial impact. Now, the incident itself wasn't large. Mm. But what I realized was that I had delegated without governance. Okay, that's an interesting phrase. What do you mean by the delegating uh, without that, governance? So, okay. so, you know, you can't do everything yourself. When sure. you are yeah. managing a team, you get work done mm. through team members and therefore you have to delegate your responsibilities. When you delegate though, you have to have some sort of a framework which allows you to keep track of how they're delivering, what they're doing. Absolutely. And I don't mean uh, governance in the form of, you know, um, micromanagement yeah, yeah. or over control or sure. anything like that. Uh, what I mean is create a framework of some sort of a regular review mm. um, or, you know, some uh, authorization matrix, if you will, right. uh, because, you know, you are managing money but have that governance in place. Mm. And that also has been one of, I think, the core tenets of my leadership style, right? Uh, which has stayed with me. Delegate with governance. Delegate with governance. I think this is such an important point because usually when I've seen people, like, you know, when they're sort of, um, you know, delegating, there's being a manager is a totally different skill set, right? Like the skill yeah. set that you require to be a manager, to have their authority, but at the same time, getting the job done and reviewing the work, it's yeah. its a tricky scenario. But I love this phrase, which is why I think uh, delegating with governance is, is great. But I actually want to speak to you now about, uh, like, you know, within TIA, Global Capabilities, right? Because you right now you're CEO, right? But before that, you've had, you know, very influential and very important parts, uh, you know, you've occupied that within the company. So I really want to know what are some of the principles, and you spoke about one framework, but any other mental models or any other values that really helped you reach the top and really stay there right because people don't realize that being at the top it's it's such a difficult journey not just reaching there but even being there right it can be lonely it can be you can have so many trials and tribulations uh, but what are some of the principles that have stayed uh, on while you've been at the company uh, there are many and i obviously mentioned some of them yeah you know, empathy or planning mm -hmm. execution or delegation governance all mm -hmm. of that uh, we just talked about and it is true what you say Getting there is probably easier than staying there. Right, right, yeah. But I would add one more aspect uh -huh. about leadership, and that is the ability to take calculated risks. Mm -hmm. Sure. You, you cannot really run a business uh, without taking some risk at some point in time. So how do you do that? Because sometimes you have to take decisions in completely ambiguous situations where you do not have enough information right. uh, to take the risks. So, how I would recommend uh, folks to think about that is to become aware of the risks and po potential impact uh, if something were to go wrong. Mm. So, basically, go into it with your eyes open with an appreciation of the risk that you're going to have to manage right. if this went south. Right. Um, you're just then better prepared. Mm. And while I can't, of course, quote any specific risk incidents um, from, from my present and past employers. I'd like to take the example of my own career okay. because those are personal risks that I sure, take. Yeah, right? you, you manage your career just yeah. like you, you know, manage every other thing in life. Yeah. 
Um, if you look at my background, I have constantly moved domains, industries, uh, functions, roles. Yeah. Uh, and every time I've had to uh, roll up my sleeves, unlearn and relearn. And in many of those cases, I've taken risks because I did not know fully what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, those were calculated risks because the roles were somewhat linked to one another. They were ultimately all within different domains of financial right. services. So I wasn't really uh, completely... Uh, you know, blank slated mm. when I went into those roles. And I had a plan of research and the fact that I, you know, I would go into full scale learning in the initial stages, right. which sort of hedged those mm. roles. So that is how I would encourage people to think. But absolutely, as a leader, be prepared to face risks and sometimes accept them. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned risks. And one thing that really comes to mind, and I was, I was also watching this and reading about this, is this term called expected value, right? When you're sort of taking a risk, you need to know what your expected value is so that you can sort of hedge those risks and you can actually, you know, gain benefits as well. So it's using probabilities, statistics. So that's a very interesting concept. But, you know, the way I look at it, like you're also being very creative with your risks. I think you're like, you know, you're within the boundaries, but you're also playing around with that. So uh, regarding work, right? Regarding, you know, work, of course, it's changing and how global companies are really shifting the way you know, they're, they're operating, right? Because there are more, like, you know, people are hiring freelancers, for example, right? That's also that's one, one big trend that's happened. But how do you, at DIA Global Capabilities, how do you want to steer the organization where, of course, you want to keep, you know, the heft of, let's say, an MNC or a big organization, but at the same time, be agile, be a great place to work. So how is that happening? And how are you making sure that that's happening from the top? That, of course, is a very, um, uh, you know, very, very topical question today. Yeah, yeah. Just the pandemic and, Absolutely. and, you know, you reference freelancers, the gig economy, yeah, yeah. which is sort of slowly making itself felt in India. We've not typically been that in the past mm. in, in my career, but now that is an emerging trend. Absolutely. Um, at TIA Global Capabilities, um, we are very conscious that we want to enable our associates to have the right work-life integration. Okay. Now, I use the word integration, integration. very intentionally. Okay. Okay. Um, because I think the word work life balance mm -hmm. today seems to indicate to me that there are two different things, completely different things that one is trying to balance out against one yeah, another. Yeah. And the pandemic really brought our work spaces into our homes. Mm. Um, the word balance really went out of the window. Yeah. You couldn't balance right. in such a situation. So you integrate mm. and the world integrated. Um, and in that spirit, we uh, give the flexibility to our employees to work a few days in the week from the office and a few days from oh, nice. home or remotely, just to ensure that they have uh, the opportunity to, of course, collaborate and interact with their own colleagues. That's also and, very important. And yeah. to maintain the culture, to mm. ensure that it thrives. But at the same time, they have the opportunity to prioritize their personal mm. uh, topics that they need to. We just want all our associates to bring their best selves to work. I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, this has become such an important and interesting topic, really, which is now companies are really using this to, it's almost like a competitive advantage where you would obviously want your associates and whoever's working there to, you know, be in a good environment and to ensure that, you know, you while you're coming to work, you're actually feeling happy while you're doing the work. Right? It shouldn't be too much of pressure. But at the same time, again, I, I'm really a big advocate of being there and working with your teams and whatnot. But speaking about competition, right? Like it's it's always very interesting to to look at this question because uh, how do you look at these competitive advantages, right? Like how do you uh, want to make sure that TIA global capabilities when it comes to talent, when it comes to the culture, how do you sort of, is competition something you would think about or how do you sort of navigate this? Because, uh, you know, you always sort of look there and be like, oh, they're doing such a great job or we want to be better than them. But what's your framework when it comes to competition and competitive advantages? That can be a pretty vast <laughs> question to answer. Right. We, of course, benchmark constantly right. uh, with what the industry is doing, mm -hmm. what the you know, what the competition mm -hmm. is doing, what peer companies are doing. Right. But I truly feel that uh, TIA Global Capabilities is already a differentiated workplace. And I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit because it lies in our culture, which really believes in empowering our associates to create value. Okay. 
and innovate for best results. We are always focused on our clients and associates. Lovely. And we've received a lot of accolades over the last uh, 12 months, which are in recognition of the inclusive culture that we've created. Right. Internally, we foster a lot of collaboration. And what do I mean by that? Um, it's, you know, various teams like uh, business operations or finance or HR coming together with their technology colleagues and innovating, improving processes, upgrading systems, and really upping the ante on overall operational efficiency. We've had some great results. Right. To foster this kind of an environment, um, we've also curated flagship learning programs with okay. some of the premier institutes uh, like IIT Mumbai, um, UPS, and Deradu, uh, ISC Bangalore. We also um, regularly conduct hackathons. Um, we have um, fintech collaboration days. Mm. Everything that needs to be done really to keep that innovation fire right, burning. Right, right. And now we are actually also setting up some very interesting functions in India. Uh, these functions were not there earlier in TI Global Capabilities. And these are an eclectic bunch of functions, but all of them are business facing. Okay. Um, so marketing operations, um, client experience design, um, sales and distribution support, climate risk, mm. actuarial, there's a long list of them. Very, very exciting times. Um, and what that will do for us is that we will now become a true microcosm of the firm in India with every wow. function being present. And by the way, it takes, it has taken some of our peers about nine to 10 years to get here. Wow. And we are doing nine to it, 10 years, you yes, said, not months. Okay. To set up some of these functions. Okay. And we are doing it in about six to seven years, which speaks volumes about the talent Lovely. and the culture that we have. And when all of these functions are set up, uh, I'm personally extremely excited about the power of collaboration and the unlocking of value that can happen front to back because everybody is together, yeah. co-located mm. and talking to one another and looking at things holistically. It's just an exciting place to be in. Another thing that's really exciting and thank you so much for that because I also got like a snapshot of what you folks are doing and how internally it's like, you know, how you're differentiating yourself. But I also want to speak about technology, right? Because, you know, you agree with Mandela that Technology is really, it's been an enabler, but it's been a disruptor, like, you know, it's changed so many things. Uh, but I want to know from your perspective at TIA Global Capabilities, how you leveraging technology, right? Because uh, people are obviously, there's the whole conversation about AI and chat GPT, which is an entire <laughs> podcast on its own, right? But I want to know from you as to how you're leveraging technology, uh, because again, it's perhaps for the long term, right? You use tech today so that you can have a better life tomorrow. Uh, but how's that happening uh, within the firm? Happening in various ways, the, you know, the the power of technology today is in its all pervasiveness, mm. right? Of course, in our workplaces, mm. but also in our lives. I mean, mm. if you look around, whether it's telecom or banking, retail, automotives, fashion, travel, yeah. um, uh, security, mm. you can no longer imagine a world where platforms are not enabled by technology. Of course, some of us have seen that world, which is a separate discussion. <laughs> right. um, but uh, we are, the tomorrow is here. Mm. Uh, and we cannot ignore that trend anymore. Mm. The other few trends which have emerged in, in the last uh, few years is the enormous increase in computing power. Absolutely. Uh, which has really catapulted the rate of acceleration in technical transformation uh, to a stage where you know, sometimes your uh, the mind boggles. Mm. And then there is the emergence of data Absolutely. as the new oil, yeah, so to yeah. speak. And the amount of et effort that's going into structuring of data, simplification of data, mining of data to further businesses. And we live with that every day. And then the third aspect, I think, is the emergence of threat actors mm -hmm. um, and cybersecurity in the virtual world that we now operate in. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, always seem a step ahead of us and you know, the whole world and the whole te technology world, so to speak, is um, preparing to ensure that we are well covered. Yeah. Right? 
Now at um, TIA Global Capabilities in India, we are well positioned to integrate all of these trends and move forward with our, with our agenda. Um, for example, we are building very large cyber and data capabilities in India. We have an aggressive um, uh, transformation program globally, mm. uh, which is uh, pushing our cloud adoption rates. We are very fast integrating emerging technology like low-code, no-code, artificial intelligence, right. machine learning into our programs and applications. And we are really leveraging every technical avenue possible to improve our client and associate experience in a digitally enabled, data powered and secure by design way. That's, that's the strategy we've adopted. And thank you so much for mentioning those benchmarks and those best practices really for uh, TIA Global Capabilities. It really seems to me that it's a compelling place to work. But um, how can people find you? Like, where can people apply to be a part of uh, the TIA Global Capabilities family? Well, we are hiring. Okay. Wow. That's good. Visit our career page uh, at TIA India. You will also find us uh, on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. Okay. Great. Lovely. Anila, we had a great conversation so far, but I have to ask you one question, right, which is about leadership. And I want to really taper this off with leadership is um, who is, and I'm, you know, this can be across industries, across domains. Uh, who is your best example or your favorite leader of all time? And uh, what advice would you give to people who are just starting out in terms of leadership? Any frameworks, any any words of you know caution, perhaps? So these two questions, like who's your idol uh, across domains? And what would you like to say to the, to the younger folks as well? Well, I don't have one idol. Right. Um, there are many leaders that I have come across during my journey. And... They are not necessarily public figures. Ah, interesting. Um, because the learning that I've had from them has been quite exemplary. And there are various aspects of leaders that you, um, you know, that you imbibe, even, even if you're not thinking of them at role, as role models at that point in time, you realize later that you've imbibed some of those, um, uh, some of those aspects of the right. leadership. So I won't take names, mm. but I will end with this. As one looks for a role model, it's important to imbibe what you like, but it's also important to understand what you do not like mm. and what you do not want to be a part of your leadership makeup, right. makeup so to speak. Right. So that would be my parting comments on this question. Lovely, lovely. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for this conversation. Uh, Andrea, this was a great conversation. I learned so much about TIA Global Capabilities and, gen and leadership in general. So thank you so much for sharing words of wisdom. Uh, that's it for episode one of this podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. <laughs>